verse 1a, 1 So we're beginning. My, my brethren, if you recall, this is James, the brother of Jesus. And I, I just, as I was listening to some teachings relevant to this area of Scripture, uh, I guess God, of course, he mentions how many times he uses the brethren and how many. And, you know, the, the interesting part, an interesting part, I mentioned it last week, of, of the fact that this was Jesus' brother. And here he is extending that brethren to us, you know, that, that familial greeting to us. And it's, it's just for me, it, it, uh, it just reminds me makes me think, do I do I really consider, do I live in the in the truth that I am joint heirs with Christ? That he's my brother, that I that, you know I'm an heir to the king. We're, we're sons of God through him. And that's a you know, can we live in that truth? Do we live in that truth? That's it's easy to say it, speak it, yeah, this joint heirs with Christ. Hey brother this was James. This is James, his physical brother, who became his his spiritual brother. He's extending that brotherhood, that greeting of brotherhood to us. We are joint heirs, sons of God. Do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. So our discernment of the Immensity of measurements is, is kind of relative. Um, I'm sure Mike could have a ton of examples of in certain situations, you know, a, a tiny eighth of an inch matters in measuring. In other situations, two inches doesn't really matter all that much. You know, I, mean, I, I don't know, but, it, but there's depend the, the, how much a measurement matters really matters when you really. Um, shrinks the bigger the picture gets. And so we tend to look at other people and their differences, whether it's they're smart, not very smart, they're rich, not very rich, they're powerful, not very powerful, they're uh, name whatever thing we differentiate, strong, weak, whatever it is. And he pulls this out, the Lord of glory, and all of a sudden you, whatever differences, the strongest man versus the weakest man that's ever been on this earth. There is, they're so close in strength compared to the Lord of glory that it's like there's no difference at all. It's, it's he's, he is, you know, magnifying Jesus to the point that we shrink and recognize that our differences are not that much, no matter how awesome we think we are. We're just not that much better than anybody else. There's a... Uh, I, I, can't, I couldn't find um, <coughs> a passage. Of, there's, there's a book. I can't remember what it was at this point. But it talks about this very concept, talking about the, the highest peak mountains versus the lowest valleys in the, in the ocean. And if you, you know, if the earth is the size of a bowling ball, they're less than the, than the peaks and valleys that are on that smooth bowling ball that we can't even feel. No matter, you know, 26,000 feet high and, you know, whatever, 9 or 10 miles deep in Mariana's trenches, yeah. right. they're, they're the, in, in relation to the size of the earth, they're, they're less than the deviations variation on the surface of a bowling ball so that it becomes nothing when you, when, you, when you draw that scope out. I think that's the same thing that we, when we draw the scope out to, to the Lord of glory, our differences between each other are very minimal at best and unimportant for sure. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, 
and there sh should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the man, you stand there, the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. I'll pause there. There's a, a just a natural tendency of, of how we act around people that we think are of some stature that's important, whether it's they're rich, whether it's they're powerful, whether it's they're very successful in something we want to be successful at in life, or what you know, whether it's football, whether it's whatever, we have that tendency to you know, I, I'm I'm kind of a contrarian personality, so any anytime there's you know anytime there's anybody who's famous or important for me, I'm intentional about it. I'm not caught that. I'm not saying that's right, just how my personality is. But the feeling is there nonetheless of, ooh, so famous, ooh, very rich, rich and famous. You know, so there, there's that, that feeling of, um, of import that we give them just because on the earth they seem important. And then the, the, on the contrary, with the poor man, how often is, is our tendency to want to cross over to the other side of the street or oh I'm busy over here cleaning something and I can't can't talk to this person who maybe is annoying or has a bad habit or has a you know infirmity that, that, that causes something to not be pleasant to be around whatever it is our tendency as humans is to want to go the other way not 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 give them this, the same uh, respect and reverence that we would the, the rich man. And so, and then I'm kind of a, a thought to this. Um, I'm sure many of you guys are, are beyond this, but, you know, if you think about, if you were going to have a meeting with Jeff Bezos, the, the guy who owns Amazon, what would you, what type of preparation, you had 30 minutes to talk to him about anything you wanted to talk to him about. Richest man in the world. What would you talk to them about? I would say many of you guys here would be, be about Jesus. But, but, but think about the fact that, you know, the, the, the natural human tendency is going to be, what can this guy do for me? <laughs> How can he help me get ahead in life? I mean, yeah, it's talking about all those type of things that, that can help me in some way. And, and think of the same thing. So you're, you're probably going to prepare for that meeting. You're going to have notes. You're going to have all this stuff you're going to want to try to say and do and have plans and try to get involved in your plans. And what about a 30-minute meeting with a homeless man? Are you going to have the same preparation? For that? That's kind of the same the idea that, that I think James is getting at here is do you, do you consider them the same of importance or do you prepare one way for one one way for another, we're not prepared at all. It's just like, I don't even want to go to that meeting, you know? And so that's what James is getting at, is that that's, that's normal human activity. We, we as followers of Christ should not be, that should not be in the church. That should be nowhere to be found in the church. It is. It's, you know, it is for sure. Uh, there's, there's that tendency in all of us in one way or another, the Lord is should be rooting out of us, but some all of us are somewhere in that uh, maturity level of maturity there to, to, to how we treat people. Uh, verse four: Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And so, the judges with evil thoughts. One of those evil thoughts that that's obviously Part of this is what can they do for me? That is, it's the selfish, the selfish mentality of a relationship is, is uh, I'm going to treat you one way based on what you can do for me, and you can, you can have give a big donation to the church. You can, we can be much better off because you give a big donation, or, or no, you're going to be a drag on the church because you're going to be asking for food every week. And, you know, so that's the, what is the 
the how do we approach people? Are we approaching them and how can we serve them? Or how can they serve us? And that's you know, how, how are we approaching people? That's one way of evil. The other is the ideas that, that are uh, encapsulated in the prosperity gospel, health and wealth. You know, those are those are doctrines of disunity. They, they cause a breakdown in unity between brothers and sisters because they those who are healthy look down at those who are not. And those, you know, and so just cause it, those who are wealthy look down at those. Well, you just don't have enough faith. If you just pray better, if you just pray differently, if you just have more faith, you, you can be rich too, look like me. And so it, it, can, it can have a tendency to, to cause that disunity within the body, not to mention the damage it does to those who are struggling with health issues, are struggling with poverty. They may not have any real way to get anything to do with it, but be it a health issue, be it a, you know, as, as an example, one of our brothers here in, in, the, uh, in the body who's in a wheelchair. There's not a single thing. He has faith more than any of us. And there's not a, not a single thing that he did to cause that. You know? And and yet our, our tendency is when we look at people in, in different situations, we judge and say, well, if you wouldn't do this, or you wouldn't do that. And there's some truth in the matter. It's not that our decisions don't matter. And we should be wise with what we do and make wise decisions and not waste money and be good stewards. And all those things are true and all those things are, are things that we should discern. But we need to be very careful to fall from discerning to judgment and evil thoughts and Considering ourselves better than um, verse five. Listen, my beloved brother, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith, heirs of the kingdom, which He promised to those who love Him? Being poor is a trial in itself, often a lifelong trial. This kind of reminds me to go back to James 1, 2 through 4. My brother, count all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The rich men, we are reminded in Matthew, and I say again to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Obviously, it's impossible for any of us to enter the kingdom of God without Christ, without faith in Him. But it specifies a rich man here for a reason, because the temptation of a rich man is, is I'm a self-made man, I can rely on myself, I don't need to trust anybody else. That's the, that's the temptation when you you have been highly successful uh, with, the, with the effort you've put it in your life. That's a temptation, a real temptation. And, and, and it's a temptation that the poor often don't, don't have to deal with and that they've discovered they can't rely on themselves. They, can't, they, they, they are not the producers of um, their care. Where the rich can tend to, can tend to think that. Uh, I will, I will say one thing that just kind of a, a point of note we probably ought to think is that any of us, nearly everybody in America falls in the rich category as far as human history goes. We're, we're living in one of the wealthiest times and one of the wealthiest nations that, that it has ever been. And not that there's not poverty here, but most most of us fall well within the rich side, and so we need to be very aware of the of the tendency to trust ourselves rather than you know, trust the Lord, uh, trust our hard hard work and our effort and our and forgetting the fact that nearly everything we have, never, not nearly every good gift we have, our intelligence, our parenting, our strength, our problem-solving abilities, and all of those are gifts given to us. There is no such thing as you, you are a self-made man. It is a, those are gifts and tools that, the God, that God gave you uh, ultimately for His glory. 
not for us to pat ourselves on the back. Six and seven. But you have dishonored the poor man. Do, do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? Obviously, James is using a broad brush, but ultimately it's mostly true. It's very often that the, the rich are very much uh, entwined in corrupting government, entwined in corrupting culture, entwined in, um, in using their power to continue to enrich themselves even further and oppressing those who are unable to protect themselves. We, we, and, you know, we, we see an absolute ton of corruption in our, in our country and across the world right now. And that's evident in, you know, we, we used to be a relatively free capitalistic society. You know, we, so you hear the, you know, the socialist side of the house right now rail against capitalism. But what we have now is not capitalism. It's a crony capitalism that's, that has the, the rich corporations and the governments tied together, you know, keeping themselves wealthy and powerful while the average people were having a hard time doing much more than surviving. And so, you know, what I'm saying is James is not saying, oh, capitalism is bad, socialism, socialism is what we should do. Rich, rich are bad, you should take care of the workers. It, that's not what James is getting at. What James is, is, is getting at is uh, why you in the church, are you so enthralled by the rich when most of the time they're just taking advantage of you and using you and oppressing you. <coughs> Verse 9. Verse 8, I'm sorry. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbors as yourself. Let me try to read that again. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, which is, that's Joel's words, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Just love your neighbor as yourself. Nothing more, nothing less. Treat other brothers and sisters, whether rich, poor, high, middle, low class, with the same love and consideration with which you treat yourself. Otherwise, you are in sin. He makes no bones about it, period. You're in sin. There's no excuse. There's no justification. You are in sin. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who has said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So he's, he's applying this, this breaking of the, the royal law or the, you know, what you know, Jesus consolidated the law down to, applying that to, the, to a couple of the laws that were originally given. And if you break any of those in any place, it's broken. You are a law breaker at that point, period. No matter how small or inconsequential you think your sin is, you have broken that law. So speak and do so as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So again, going back to the idea, remember we're not all so different. Remember that um, wherever people are, whether they seem to be trapped in a sin that's Outwardly, culturally, we really don't like that sin. But you know, if you think of it, in our culture, we have a tendency within the church to rail against things like homosexuality and completely give a pass on things like gluttony. You know, and as somebody who is that is a sin that I struggle with. That that's the reality. Is, is we have a tendency. I myself have a tendency to look over there, man, it's homosexuality is really bad, and then I should really stop eating too much. Like it's not that big of a deal. That's a sin. Equal 
and I'm, and I and I and I make excuses and justifications equal. And so we need to. The reality is that, is that we have broken God's laws, and we need to remember our sin and the mercy that we received, so that we can, you know, extend that same mercy. Uh, to others, remember that we're not so different. We tend to categorize ourselves, and and, and our tendency is always whatever categor categorizations we build in our mind, we're always in the better one. That's just kind of the <laughs> we we divide it up just so that we're better. And that's that that's the tendency. It's not not always true. It's not always, but that's the, the human tendency. One day you will need to be shown mercy, of course, by Christ. But there, you may you may find yourself in a situation where you'd like to receive mercy, and, and will you want to be treated like you treat others, like you've treated others who have not been uh, maybe esteemed highly by you? Verse fourteen. Um, before we jump into 14, so this this section of scripture, James is all about doing. It's the act, putting faith into action. This is the this is the controversial, you know, bit of scripture that, that Catholics like to use, and that Martin Luther actually he because of this he he didn't think James should be in the Bible, and so he um, he thought it was. A, Incorrectly included the canon, and so. Um, but one thing we have to think about James and remember through his eyes is that his nickname was Old Camel Knees, and those those Camel Knees. If you've seen Camel Knees, you know they have the big pads on. Well, those Camel Knees that he had was he spent hours and hours and hours in prayer, seeking the Lord, hours and hours of the prayer. After the Father's heart, he, he grew up next to Jesus. He saw perfect faith, and it wasn't doing. It, it was doing. It wasn't sitting around believing. Jesus was doing, and so and his hours of prayer led him to the point where he where he realized that there is there really is no such thing as a faith that doesn't do things. It's it's just dead. It just if, if if you just believe something. And it doesn't cause you to to do things according to with what you're saying you believe. You really don't believe that thing. It's plain and simple. If I, if if my child's running in the road and I believe there's a semi truck heading towards him, and I'm just like, eh, I probably really don't believe there's a semi truck. I'm either absolutely heartless. Why well, don't I really believe there's a semi truck coming? Otherwise, I'd do something about that semi truck coming. And so, that's that's kind of where where James had come to. He saw perfect faith in action in Jesus, uh, and he spent time and time and time and time on his knees seeking the Father's heart. And, and this is where he, this is what he came to in this in fourteen. What does it profit, my brother, if someone? says he has faith but does not have works. Can faith save him? Martin Luther was not wrong in sola fide, I think is how it's pronounced, is in faith alone. And he clung to that. And so that so he, he really obviously struggled with this book. Can faith save him? The question, and we get answered here in a little bit, is: Is a dead faith can't save you? It's, it's got to be. It's got to be more than just a concept we have in our mind. It's got to be. If it, the question is not: Are you saved by faith alone? The question is: Is your faith a saving faith? Is it a faith that actually is an active, action, actionable? thing. Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, 
And when he says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Your words to them, no matter how much faith you have, have zero value to them. If God is saying, you know, we should not just see those in need, which have a happy, joyful heart, we, I want good for you. No, but go out and meet that need. Put, put your put your feet to the ground and your hand to work to meet that need of the, the person who is in need. Verse 17. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Again, a faith, if a faith is dead, can it save? Is it really faith at all? And I want to Verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. So think about that. How, if you cannot do good works, if you, how can you show someone your faith? And that's, that's what Almost in a sarcastic way, James is, you can't even show me your faith if you don't have words. How, how can your faith be real to me, somebody outside of you, if I don't see you do anything good? I can't, it's not real to anybody but you, maybe, if you don't put that faith into action in the words. So he's saying, you can't even show me your faith. Without works, but I can show you my faith by the works that I do. You believe, okay, sorry, let me read that. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even demons believe and tremble. So what he's he's kind of pointing out here, and again, it almost a almost a, a, a you know, I don't want to say mocking, but almost like a okay, you believe, good job. Demons believe. It's not not about just just a you know believing something. Demons believe this thing is a true thing. There is one God, and the demons know it, and they tremble before him. And that doesn't say. But you, I do want to actually, before I go on here, I do want to, as a, as a caveat, as a, when the enemy has lost one of us to Jesus, he is, he's lost. He, but the reality is, it, it, is his next play is to make us useless to the kingdom. And he has lots of tools in his bag to make us not very, you know, whether it's, I mean, there's all sorts of, there's, you know, theological tools as far as, you know, you think of Calvinism. Hyper-Calvinism drives you, drives you to the point of, well, it doesn't matter what I do or don't do, they're either saved or not saved. So it could be a theological, you know, in, incorrect that, that drives you to, well, no point to do anything because it doesn't have an effect in anything. It could also be, you know, you get yourselves caught in the in the weeds of, of life, and, and there's all sorts of things that 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 the enemy can use to keep us from being fruitful believers. Uh, he does all sorts of things that, that can take a true believer who has true saving faith and put them in neutral to where they're not very useful to the kingdom. It's not that they don't have faith, but, but the problem is they continue to stay in neutral. That faith begins to die. Stay there too long, that faith faith can die. And so there's there's a we need to you know, recognize that sometimes we'll see a brother or sister 
stuck, and we need to help them, encourage them, and disciple them on to moving again. Not that they're not necessarily saved, just because they're, you know, they're, they're stuck in a wrong thought, or stuck in a, stuck, sometimes you're just stuck emotionally, or stuck, you, you, you know, had bitterness or unforgiveness towards someone, and you're stuck again. And that's the, the point being is, is not serving the Lord is not an option. It's, it's, we are to serve the Lord. We are to be busy walking out of this faith. Verse 20. But you, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Reiterating the point. Is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by faith works, excuse me, by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. Fulfilled in what way? So if you if you recall back to uh, that that verse, I'll go back to Genesis 15. Genesis 15, 5 and 6. This is the Lord talking to him. Then he brought him aside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be, he says to the childless Abraham. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. So at that point, it was accounted to him for righteousness. But then, but then we're taken forward to the scene where he's standing over now his, his, his son, his son of promise who this is supposed to be fulfilled through. And the Lord says, kill him. Take him up on the mountain. Put him on the altar and kill him. This, is, this was faith walked out. Here he is. The, just, the faith was, I'm trusting God said, I'm going I'm to have this is what God said. I'm going to have descendants like the stars in heaven. This is my only son. Through whom that could happen. God's going to do something to make this work. I don't know what it looks like. This is hard. What he's, I mean, I can't even imagine. I remember my, my son asked me when he first heard this story, would, would you kill me? And that's a tough question. I mean, I would hope I would. <laughs> you know? That's a tough question to, you know. I don't right now. I don't remember how I answered the question. That was one of those questions that came out of, you know, the the probably the right way to answer that is. I would hope I would have the faith of the Lord. Whatever happens, the Lord wants the best for you and for me out of that. And so, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I'd have the faith to do that. I mean, just being transparent, that's tough. And so, but here, here we have Abraham, who has the faith and is walking it out. Thinking of, think of that walk, that hill, knowing what he's got at the end of this. Yeah, trusting. Yeah, he has faith, but that faith is is, is being walked out to perfection. Is, is kind of what's happening. It is no longer is it, is it a thought. Eh, I believe God's going to. No, it's walked out. I know God is going to give me descendants that through this young man who he has told me to kill. I don't know what's going to happen. But God's going to work it out. I trust Him to work it out. I trust Him to be faithful to the promise that He gave me. And He walked out that. We walked out that faith, making it perfect in works.
You see then that a man is justified by works and not only, excuse I can't read it, and not by faith only. Our faith should be a living faith that causes us to act in according with the will of who we have put our faith in. Our faith should be a living faith that causes us to act in accordance with the will of who we have put our faith in. Verse 25, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Rahab, a prostitute forever memorialized in Scripture, forever uh, honored as being in the line of our Messiah. This is Rahab, the prostitute, who heard of what the Lord, was, the, the God of Israel, was doing for His people. That's all she. That's all the Scripture tells us. Is she had heard what God was doing for His people, and that was the extent of her faith. That she heard, trusted that He was God, and because of that, she then aligned herself with what He was doing with His people in protecting. Uh, the messengers and, and taking care of them and hiding them and sending them out. And in that, in that work, based on that tiny little faith of just what she had heard that God was doing with His people. And I want, I want you to think about that. What is God hearing? What, what are the people around you, around me, hearing about what God, God is doing? Are they hearing about what God doing, is doing in me and, and in my church and in my family? Or are they just, you know, we're just talking about football or we talk about what are they because that hearing, not necessarily walking up to everybody at the water cooler and slapping them in the face of the gospel, but just talking in conversation about what the Lord's doing. They're hearing that. And they can the Lord can use that to begin to grow a little faith like he did. She just heard rumor of what God was doing. The God of Israel was doing. And that faith grew into uh, the faith that saved. The faith that was walked out and works. And the faith that was aligned with what God was doing. Verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And this is this <laughs> this is was a very hard chapter. <laughs> it is a very hard chapter. Um, I'm with you that it's, that it's hard. It's, it's it's meant to bring life. It's meant to uh, bring life not in you, not only in you, but to bring life to those around you. Probably heard it said a lot and that if if God hadn't saved us to do something, He just would have taken us the minute we said the prayer. And part of our altar call was a you know, she no, no, He left us to do things. He left us to reach out to those around us. He left us um, to spread the good news. And he left us not not to get caught up in in. Earthly minded trivial matters. Uh, it's not easy, but let's let's be reminded, let's draw near and, and do what the Lord has called us to do. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for these men. I thank you, God, for your work in me. And I pray, Lord, that but each of us would have some hearts, uh, not, not our minds made up, but weak toward your word. Willing to learn, willing to be um, exhorted.